Hi everyone, and welcome to episode one of Hibs Pod, where yet another new Hibs podcast. I'm your host Stuart, and I'm joined by my co-host Gavin. Any users of Hibs.net who are listening might know us as Pretty Boy and Vault Boy, respectively. Obviously, at the moment, there's a real gap in the market for Hibs podcasts. There's only about 100 or so on the go, so here we are to fill that gap. Seriously though, there's a lot of great Hibs content out there at the moment with some guys doing some really good stuff, so we thought we'd try something just a little bit different. We'll be recording monthly and it will be a little, there'll still be a little bit of discussion about Hibs and general football chit chat, however the bulk of each episode will be an interview with someone connected to the club. This month we're delighted to be joined by a Hibs legend, a Scottish Cup winner, Darren McGregor. So now you know what we are and who we are, let's get on with things. Great introductions there. See, I've not heard it. I've, I'm already peeling back the veil. <laughs> yeah, uh, welcome to the first episode of Hibs.pod. Uh, we thought we'd kick off things. We recently announced our latest donation to Hibs. Um, let's get the exact figure because I know Stu's very proud of this one. Uh, we're at £10,187.50, so eighteen seventy five. obviously on the nose in the middle of that. You'll be delighted about that, Stu. Yeah, um, absolutely. Brilliant. Um... You know, I can kind of remember the days or the tail end of the days when people were having to pay money out of their own pocket to keep the, the site online. Um, so, yeah, where, where, we've, where we've come from and where we are now, we can kind of make that kind of donation. And it's not really a one off. It's something that we're doing annually. You know, we're, we're, we've got additional spend with things like um, shirt sponsorships. We buy hospitality packages that we kind of auction, not auction off, um, you know, sell off to members in the competitions and such like. Um, so yeah, um, it's it's brilliant that we can support the club in this way, especially at this time. It's not um, it's not an earth shattering amount of money, but it's extra money that's allowing the club to spend um, on something that otherwise might not get bought. So yeah, brilliant, really good. Exactly. Uh, well, tying into that, we we also announced that the total for for Hibs and its contributions to Hibs over the years is now about one hundred twenty thousand uh, pounds. That makes the latest donation quite a large one in the grand scheme of things as well. So clearly, things of the site have been going pretty well. In terms of trying to generate some some revenue, uh, all of which you know goes to Hebs in some capacity. Uh, alongside this episode of a podcast, we're also launching the raffle for a signed Lewis Stevenson shirt. So be sure to get yourself involved with that. Any of the funds raised from that raffle will go towards the Hanlon and Stevenson Foundation. So um, it's a great prize, a great cause. So yeah, definitely get yourself involved. Yeah, as as Gav says, that's going to be um, that's going to be announced on the site in the next um, couple of days. Um, the shirt's currently sitting looking at me from my drawer at the moment, um, so we'll get we'll get that framed up for um, for the winner um, in due course. Um, yeah, so it's a great prize, and um, we're really grateful to to Lewis for sorting that out for us. So, in order to help you get to know us a little bit better, and also us to to get to know each other a little bit better as well, uh, <laughs> we're just arranging a a quick sort of five questions each, very quick fire, nothing crazy, um, just in order to uh, shed some light on on. Who's talking to you right now? So I think Stu, you wanted to take the lead on that one. Yeah, um, I'll go first on that one. So, um, Gavin, your quick fire five questions. Uh, number one, first game. Do you remember it? Uh, my first game that I went to was a throwaway league victory against Kilmarnock in two thousand five. I think Paul Dalglish scored the winner. So blast from the past. Um, exactly. Number two, uh, what colour should a Hibs away strip be? Controversial. I like the white ones. Yeah, nice and simple. Yeah. As long, eh, anything but yellow. <laughs> <laughs> um, a pie or your steak or a mince man? Uh, definitely steak. Yeah, keep mints away. Uh, non football favourite band? Uh, this is where I sound all pretentious, but uh, I'd go Gregory Alan Isakov, who's a folk artist in America. Nice. And finally, favourite Hibs player, past or present, or past and present, if you'd prefer? The easy answer is John McGinn. I'll go a little bit uh, indie and say uh, Buzalon, probably growing up my favourite player. Yep, excellent. Sounds good to me. Right, so the return leg, Stu. First question, favourite away day in Scotland? Uh, Ibrox. There we go, nice and quiet. Uh, which Hibs player did you really like that other fans seem to hold sort of mixed feelings about? Uh, for me, I would say probably Chris Hogg. I thought Chris Hogg was a, a very good defender, um, had a good bit of longevity, um, was a good servant. Um, yeah, I, I, I rated Chris Hogg and a lot of people didn't. I think he was a bit of a Marmite figure. Aye, I liked Hoggy. 
So you're having a blowout banquet. Which takeaway are you getting? Uh, oh, Indian, probably. Main course? What's your dish? Uh, probably something quite hot, not quite foul. Maybe Vindaloo, Vindaloo maybe a Madras with a wee bit added chilli to it. Brave, brave. You were an amateur footballer, I'm sure. So what was your greatest moment playing amateur football? Um, oh, that's a tough one. Um, I, th- I think the, the moment I always remember so it'd be my first moment was back in juvenile football playing in the Scottish Cup. We were playing a really good side, came over from Glasgow to Edinburgh um, and we won 2-1 and I saved a penalty in the last minute. So yeah, my best moment in football is when I was 11 year old. Oh, there we go. Well, as a goalkeeper, it's nothing better than a penalty save, I'd imagine. So not bad. Uh, your final question. Uh, an opposition hate figure for most fans that you actually had quite a bit of time for. Um, this is going to be a really controversial one, but I never ever minded Paul Hartley. Um, didn't like him when he played for Hearts, but I can see why he enjoyed um, scoring against Hibs. And I annoyingly thought he was quite a good player as well. Um, I certainly didn't hold him in the same kind of loathing as someone like, say, Rudy Scatchel, for example. Um, I, I was going to kind of say John Robertson there, but then I don't think actually many Hibs fans really hate Robbo. So, um, mm. yeah, I, I think um, I dare say I'll get a bit of stick for that, but I, I didn't mind Paul Hartley particularly. Yeah, I'll not be agreeing with you on that one, but that's just because I want to protect my name. <laughs> um, there we go. So the quick five fives are done. You know a little bit more about us. We know a little bit more about each other. How in light now? Absolutely. Okay, so after that, I think you've just about heard enough from us. Um, just before we bring on the main man, um, Gav, what more can you say about Darren McGregor? Well, I mean, he's a man that embodies not only the club that he plays for, but I think the area he comes from. You know, he really is a Leaf man through and through, and you can tell that every time he's on the pitch, it, he plays like he's a Hibernian fan. Um, it, it sort of shines through in his game. He's a leader on the park, and he's the kind of player that you love to see playing for Hibs and doing well. Yeah, absolutely. I think um, everything about Darren McGregor is he's just the kind of guy you want to do well and you definitely want him on your side rather than against you. Um, So without further ado, without any more from us, um, let's welcome onto the show Scottish Cup winning Hibs legend Darren McGregor. Thanks very much for taking the time to join us, Darren. Uh, Much appreciated. Um, just actually before you, you um, came on there, um, I described you as Hibs legend, Darren McGregor. Um, as a sort of Hibs fan growing up, how, how does it feel to have that, that tag amongst the fan base? Yeah, obviously, listen, it's great. I think uh, to, to support Hibs growing up uh, and to have the sort of life that I've had in terms of working outside football and it not being my, my main job uh, up until the age of 25 and then probably at the tail end of my career, signing for Hibs and then winning the Scottish Cup and still being here five years later. It's, uh, it's really hard to sort of put it into, into context. I think about it sometimes and I think the appreciation will probably build the older you get. And uh, and, and and maybe when I'm retired, I'll look back on it and, I, and I'll think what a great great achievement it was. But football players, are all, I'll always tell you, you're always chasing the next thing. And uh, so in, in the meantime, I'm, I'm obviously concentrating on what's what's right in front of me. So it's, it's difficult sometimes when somebody calls you a legend. I mean, to be called a legend, it's a, it's a big, big, it's a big honour that, that the fans bestow upon you. But I'm not sure if I've, I've earned that tag yet. Maybe maybe a couple of more cup wins, a couple of second or first place finishes. That might be justified. Too hard on yourself, Darren. Um, it, we were just speaking there that you, you're out of training, contrasting baths or something like that. Contrast. Um, <laughs> I thought you only got to mention that. Oh no, we had to dig you out a bit. <laughs> <laughs> um, uh, obviously the season's been it's been a different one for you because you, you've spoken about being in training more often it's been a different one for everybody because there's been no fans there um, it's all a bit uncanny can you sort of walk us through what this season has, has looked like from your perspective as a player yeah I think obviously the main thing is that the, the fans not being at the stadium I think that's a, a massive massive miss and I think for a lot of guys I mean obviously young Josh Doig I don't think has actually played in front of home support yet and he's probably been one of the best performers all season so it's a shame for guys like that not to actually experience a uh, sort of packed Easter road uh, but in terms of uh, training and whatnot it's, it's been pretty the, the, the gaffers managed to keep the sort of continuity really really well to be honest we've not changed much in terms of what we were in middle of June as we always are and, and we had our first couple of weeks of pre-season were a bit odd because it was socially distanced but I think after um, 
after the the restrictions got sort of relaxed a little bit, we were, we were allowed contact and we've been getting tested twice a week for close to a year now. So uh, the housekeeping and obviously Smains is really really good. They've adhered to all the all the rules and regulations, so we've been well looked after. But from a training perspective, nothing nothing much has changed. We're obviously in our own bubble, so we've got a good pre season and obviously up until this point. I'm sure a lot of Hibs fans are like, yeah, they'll be happy at where we're actually placed, but we're, we really need to sort of dig deep and, and see it through because finishing in the, that third spot would be would be really uh, remarkable considering it doesn't ha- happen often. I think um, one thing that's sort of been spoken about, Darren, is um, with regards to sort of the fans is that it sometimes felt like a season where it, it's quite hard to really get into. I mean, obviously Hibs are sitting third in the league. We've been in a semi-final, you know, there's the real prospect to group stage European football next season. And, you know, we're, we're kind of sitting there and it, it's almost because you're not at games, it feels hard to it feel sort of part of it. As a player, does that kind of rub off as well? I mean, obviously you're a professional, you're going out to do your job, but, you know, would the season feel massively different, do you think, if there was fans in the ground? Yeah, I mean, it's definitely a good point you made there. I think uh, there's nothing quite like a, a sort of packed Easter road. I mean, I had to have I've obviously not played that much at the start of the season, but just the initial walkout, that took a while to get used to as well because you're walking out anticipating the sort of the, the elevation of noise and the crowd and whatnot, and that wasn't there. So all these wee things did get uh, took, a, took a while to get used to. Uh, and there's there's no doubt if the fans were there with, with eight games to go uh, in the position that we're in, it would, it would obviously... The impact of that would probably be a lot bigger, but I think we are where we're at at the minute, uh, and we just need to obviously deal with it. Deal with the fact that for you guys, it must be torture watching every single week uh, on on the television. Yeah, I mean, first and foremost, you would want to be there and supporting us, and and we get that. We've got the, the obviously the privilege of playing at Easter Road, but without the fans, it is it's it's can sometimes be difficult. I mean, there's been a lot of things said about it can go for you and it can go against you, but I do genuinely feel when obviously the fans are at the at the loudest, that is that that's it's like a 12 man and it does motivate the players. So not to have that has been it's, it's been a bit disheartening to be honest. As we're speaking now, we're we're just off the back of what's well, probably a disappointing Saturday, um, but we shouldn't let it uh, rub the shine off what was a really good month for us. Uh, you've come back into the fold in a big way. How's that been for you, sort of transitioning from? Uh, playing a role, sort of filling the squad and, and acting as a mentor to to being on the pitch every single week. Yeah, I mean, I think the Rangers game was a was a big turning point because obviously the gaffer had made a decision to put me in, uh, and I think I, I I went in and I and I acquitted myself quite well. But I think that was off the back of a lot of hard training sessions throughout the year, just keeping myself ticking over. Sometimes it can be very difficult when you, you sort of seem that far out that that the chances you play are, are that slim but to keep that motivation and to keep that drive can sometimes be difficult but I managed to do it I mean I've got a great team around me at East Mains the medical staff and stuff uh, really really top guys and girls in the department so they kept uh, they kept me well well maintained so when I did get the opportunity I, I felt like I'd taken it and uh, obviously performing really well and keeping clean sheets that's that's all you can ask as a defender uh, just really disappointed that the, the game just there on the weekend. Uh, obviously, Motherwell came with a, a certain set of tactics, and I just I think that I mean we've just spoken about it just there, fun enough. We just never dealt with the threat that they had to offer well enough, and we were seemed to get in each other's way a lot of the time. And we, we, there was a lot of uncharacteristic mistakes that I, I hadn't seen worse uh, in, in many weeks. So you just need to put it into one of their games. But I do believe that the strength and depth in our squad. Uh, definitely, definitely will be valuable in the run. I think you've you've touched on it previously, Darren, um, and you've also sort of mentioned it there about sort of, you know keeping yourself focused to get back in the team. Um, with regards to sort of your career, obviously you've spoke about it a bit in the past, but you you sort of weren't playing full time football until your sort of mid twenties. You were at Cowdenbeath, you dropped back into the juniors, went back to Cowdenbeath, and sort of won won a promotion there. How much do you think that sort of shaped your your view on football? Does it, it obviously makes you very appreciative of, of you know what what you're doing in the game now? Um, is that something that you think kind of drives you forward to keep playing as long as you can, basically? Yeah, I mean, I think I, I've been lucky enough to see sort of both sides of the fence. As I said before, I was a a football player, I was a labourer, I was a lifeguard, I was a call centre worker. Uh, I got fired for all the jobs, mind you. 
and uh, and I worked in the store folding jeans and serving customers. So to, to, to be a professional at the age of 24, I still remember Danny Lennon phoning me uh, and asking me if I wanted to become a professional football player at the age of sort of 24 and three quarters. And uh, it didn't take me too long to, to agree to him. So I was down the M8 and in, into uh, New St Mirren Park when they were. And uh, I've never looked back. So I do understand and appreciate football. I, I believe that's the best job in the world. Every young guy grows up wanting to be a football player. Uh, so for me to be given that opportunity at such a, a late age, I've, I've, I definitely do want to hold on to it. Uh, as long as I can because I know sometimes what the other side of the fence entails and, and it'd be very difficult to match the highs that, that I've managed to get to in football in, uh, in regular life so yeah as I say I'll, I'll do my utmost whether it be supporting the team or whether it be me playing in the team or doing everything over and above a lot of the, the, the small details that people don't see that you do in the background uh, to keep yourself ticking over so that when you do get the opportunity you, you take it so yeah, I want to stay in the game as long as as long as I physically can. On that note, um, with with regards to sort of obviously saying about because sort of Danny Lennon phoning you at sort of 24, 25 year old to become a professional, um, that obviously means that you didn't really go through the the academy system as a lot of young players do now. Do you feel that sort of playing juvenile football and then sort of part time football benefited you later in your career, or do you think the guys that are sort of going through the academy system have got a sort of better grounding in the game, or is there a balance between the two to be struck? Yeah, there's definitely a balance because I remember working in Excel and, and the, a lot of these young guys came in. The you know, one thing about wash bags is I didn't want to get a wash bag for the first sort of year of my career because I just seen these wee guys coming in with their hips and heart tracks with a wash bag. And I was thinking, what did they actually keep in that wash bag? So I, I just didn't want to touch a wash bag. But I, I've actually, you see now I've got, the missus got my personalised ones. <laughs> but, uh, I've came over to the other side. So just wee things like that. They had obviously, I say to a lot of the, the young guys at Hibs that, the world is your oyster. The opportunity they have at a place like East Mains where you've got nutritionists, you've got strength and conditioning coaches, you've got physiotherapists, you've got uh, great playing surfaces, you've got your kit arranged for you every morning that's washed and dried and you've got all this opportunity. All you need to do is come in with, with, with the right attitude and the right work ethic. So uh, the flip side to that, I was at Leaf Athletic till I was 18. Uh, having to pay, pay a lot of the time to train or having to buy your own stuff and wash your own stuff. Uh, so it was to a, a total, co a co complete polar opposite to what the young guys are here. So I think if you can get into a setup like Hibs, like it's definitely got to stand you in good stead. It will, it will teach you uh, how to become a professional football player and, and, and how difficult it can be. But there's not, nothing to say that the other side of the fence, the way I've done it, can also benefit you. Uh, do you see a sort of marked difference in the young players coming through now, the likes of uh, Ryan Porteous and, and some of his teammates or, uh, you know, go back even younger age groups like Josh Doig? Do you think there's a difference in attitude in the young players that you see? Is there a kind of different mentality towards a game or, uh, you know, is it the more things change the more they stay the same? Yeah, I think technically you can definitely tell, like, as I say, that it's probably one of my my weaknesses to be fair so I probably should have done more football and less less running about the streets of Leaf when I was uh, 16, 17 but no listen these guys are where I, I keep saying that about Port and Doige they're obviously one of a number of young guys that we've got uh, currently at Hibs that are way ahead of me way ahead of the curve in terms of where they are physically and uh, technically and I think a lot of the time in football I mean I've said it before that everybody's look, looking for the next big thing but these things take a while to sort of nurture. I mean, Ryan's been here since he was a, a really sort of young lad and he's only now becoming to the point whereby people are sort of recognise him. And I was saying that to Doig earlier, I think Hearts let him go a season or two ago. So, so uh, shame on them, but we, we, we've definitely we've definitely benefited from that. I can't, I can't see why you would look at somebody like Doig and think that he wouldn't be good enough to play in your first team. It's just incredible. So, but that coupled with a really good attitude as well, I think, Everybody goes on about the technical aspect and the physical aspect. That's that will get you in the door. But a lot of the time, it's how you are and around the place, how you are as a person, how you deal with adversity. Uh, I mean, as I say, there's Portland there just obviously been put on the bench for a, a few games, but his attitude throughout that period has been brilliant. He's been supporting the guys, and this is this is like a 21 year old. He could have quite easily took the huff, uh, but it's obviously it shows you the character that he's got. And, that will definitely stand them in good stead. 
for the older older he gets. And Doige is another one. Doige's 18, he's 19 this year. Uh, I mean, I couldn't tell you half the things that I got up to when I was 19. Uh, yeah, this guy's coming in here every day. He's one of the best guys in training, athletically, physically. He's one of the best and technically. He's, he's, he's got a really bright, bright future. But he's a level-headed guy as well, which is, is half the battle. Uh, just, just to come back quickly to your own career, just sort of bring you, bring us up to to date, if you like, Dan. And um, obviously, you, you spoke about Danny Lennon earlier. Um, I mean, as as a player, um, you'd obviously been with him at Cowden Beath, and when he went to St Mirren and sort of phoned you up and says, "Listen, do you want to come and play for me?" How how it's sort of something fans dread as a manager coming back and sort of raiding their old club, if you like. But as a as a player, how big a confidence boost is that to you to sort of say, you know, this guy rates me, he wants me to come with him. I mean, it must be a must be a big boost for you. I think the St Mirren fans were dreading getting three second division players as well when they came back and, and signed us. So that was that was it. I think that was the headlines on the day because uh, none of us had played full time football. But I, I've always said that to this day. I was very very fortunate because by no stretch of the imagination was I the best defender in the old division two, which is League League One at present. I just wasn't. And uh, but he knew again taking the t- the the, t- the technical and the physical attributes out. He knew what it was like as a person and how hard I worked. And maybe the limited skill set I did have, but how hard I was willing to work and double down on my strengths. And he's seen that. So it definitely gave me that opportunity to go and play at a higher level. And I'm, I'm well aware that obviously a lot of it was down to myself as well and how I applied myself and, and how as soon as I got in the door, some people might have thought that this this had, I'm, a, I'm arrived, I'm a full-time football player. This is, this is when the easy work starts. But I, for me, it was a challenge. I knew that all eyes were looking at me and I knew what was at stake. And I thought that at the age of 24, 25, these opportunities don't come a lot, come around a lot. So I knew how hard I had to work. And I did that year through all the negativity at the start of the year. At the end of the year, I'd, I'd managed to win players play of the year and supporters play of the year and played over 40 games. So that was just obviously a big chunk of that. It's Danny Lennon and him having faith in me, but that was also me repaying his faith and and the way I applied myself for that season. I think as well, obviously, it's when you had you had a couple of pretty pretty serious injuries, and then you know the, the chance obviously came to sign for for Rangers. Now, I'm wary we're on a, a Hibs podcast here, but obviously Rangers are they're a, they're a huge club. Yeah. Um, was it a tough decision to go from the Premiership back down to the Championship with Rangers, or was it you know this is kind of one chance you're going to get to go to a club like this, and I've got to take it. Yeah, I just wish Hibs would, Hibs would have came in from at that time, and then it would have made the decision easy, but. I've mentioned this a couple of times before, but Hearts was actually an option at the time as well. So that could have went completely different if I'd, I'd, I'd managed to choose them. I just remember, I remember Danny Lennon leaving and uh, Tommy Craig taking over at St Mirren and I was coming to the end of my contract. So there was something there was something there at St Mirren, but I also had a, an opportunity to go to Hearts and uh, I'd, I'd spoken to Dundee when uh, Paul Hartley was there as well. And uh, I guess I guess a phone call one day when I'm, uh, I was actually on one of my friends stag do. Uh, down in uh, Newcastle and uh, I'm getting a, a number that keeps on phoning me and I'm, I'm thinking I, I'm not sure who this number is I'll just ignore it and then I get a text for a, a guy that I used to go to in Glasgow that was mates with uh, Durant, Ian Durant saying tell Darren to answer his phone Ali McCoy's is phoning him and I told him hey, I can't swear on this but I says F off it's not Ali McCoy's phone phoning me he says answer it the next time he phones and you'll see so I'm obviously I'm uh, half cut on a Saturday morning in Newcastle and somebody's winding me up saying, I'll have the this phone on you. So anyway, answer, the, the, the phone number rings and I answer it. And lo and behold, it's, it's Alan McCoyce. And uh, he obviously says, listen, uh, would you be interested in, in signing, uh, signing for Rangers? So at, at the time, it was obviously, it's, it's a massive club. More options were Harps, Dundee, back to St Mirren. I go to Rangers for a year. So I decided that obviously taking away the biases that us Hibs fans do have once you go into Murray Park and you have a look around Ibrox and stuff, there's, there's no denying that as as a definitely a, a piece of sort of football in history. So I thought what other what other chance would they have to play with a team like that? And and uh, the league that they were in obviously wasn't 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 an issue. It was just it was an experience as a football player. I mean it was only four years before that I was I was I was working in a shop and I was playing part time football at Cowden Beef. So to get the opportunity just to play with Rangers was obviously an opportunity I couldn't turn turn down. 
And obviously there, you've, you've won the player of the year in the summer and then, you know, a couple of months later you find yourself sort of, your contract's terminated. I think it was yeah. mutual consent was the thing. Consent, yeah. The opportunity to come to Pibs comes along. I take it that was a bit of a no-brainer, was it? Yeah. You know, Pibs are here. This is the dream now. Ah, it was amazing. I remember the, I remember the, the, inter, the, the chat with Warburton as well because he had phoned me at Friday like half five and I, I thought, this, this isn't good. He's definitely not telling me that he's starting. Uh, starting on the Saturday, so I knew that the, there was something in the water, and he just pulled me in and said, "Listen, Dan and St Johnston have been on the phone. They'd like to take you." I thought, well, "I didn't even want to go to St Johnston. Why would I want to go to St Johnston?" He says, "Well, listen, can, can we help you?" Can, uh, David Weir at the time, "Can we help you? What team would you like to go to?" And I says, "Well, obviously the Hibs. I'd love to go to Hibs." And I think at the time it was when Hibs were trying to uh, Rangers were trying to get Scott Allen. I think so. There was a wee bit of wee bit of friction between the clubs and I think I remember Mark Warman said we can't be seen to to facil- facil- facilitate and sorry that move so uh, the next day I must have had a think to himself and he just says well what we'll do is we'll just release you instead of, instead of transferring into a club so I think deep down he probably knew that that was that was an option but just didn't want to be seen to to okay in it so as soon as they released me uh, I think the next day it was it was either that day or the next day I was along the I was along the, the M8 back to Edinburgh and uh, I remember just briefly meeting with, with Stubbs uh, and we got we got signed that day and it was uh, one of the one of the best days of my life. As you say there, there, there probably wasn't much of a decision to make, but I mean, at that point, had you been contacted by other clubs? Was a uh, was a Hearts offer still on the table? You know, did you have to to sort of quickly reject anyone else? So yeah, so so Hearts were Hearts were obviously before I made the decision to go to Rangers, but I, actually in between the time they were, but and telling me to be going to Hibs, I think St Johnson, uh, there was there was an offer on the table for St Johnson and I had somebody in the background saying there was maybe potential to go somewhere down south but there was nothing nothing concrete so that's why it was I, I think it was released on Sky Sports at like midday and I'd signed with Hibs at like 2 o'clock so it showed you the, the turnaround, it's not as if I was sitting on my hands waiting for something to materialise as soon as that that was an option. It, I mean I was thirty that that was me was I just turning I just turned thirty. So they would have been I says that before there was no other club that, that if if they would have came up that I would have went to. Maybe Liverpool but I don't think that I think that was, <laughs> I think that was out of the out of the question. Obviously um obviously um you've 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 ended up at Hibs um you know You've been here a fair while now. There's there's one really obvious highlight I think that if everyone knows, yeah. but out, out with that is is there any other sort of highlights moments that sort of stick in your mind as being just like great great times at Hibs? Yeah, I, I, I think there's a couple of unassuming ones. Obviously, the first time I wore the wore the jersey, I think it was Stranraer at home. I think it was a League Cup. Like the must have been. It was back then. It was the the, the round robin tournament. So it was just it was maybe the second or the third round. I might have got it wrong in the League Cup, and it was Stranraer at home, and I'd played. I played right back. I think we won the, the game one 0 uh, Pretty uninspiring performance in game, but it was just for me, as I say, growing up, a fan running around on the pitch, probably when I shouldn't have. Uh, when me and my mates used to sneak in, we used to get chased off the pitch when I was younger. So to actually fulfil that dream, that that was a, a massive highlight. Uh, scoring the goal that started the run for the Scottish Cup, I keep telling people that, but nobody's interested. And I think that year, the team that I'd beat. Rafe Rovers had went on to win the cup for the last two or three seasons, something like that, and I'd scored the the thousandth goal in the, the Scottish Cup. So all these wee, wee milestones were were uh, were great, and obviously being given that contract a couple of years ago was was unbelievable. That Hibs showed the faith in me that even if I wasn't playing, I could still contribute. So there is there's been too many to actually think about. And obviously the Scottish Cup's massive, but. Just to be coming here every day. I mean, if these guys have been out, if anybody's been out to East Mains, like especially on a day like this, it's it's just a, such a lovely place. And as I say, for anybody that's been a, a football player, to be a professional football player and to to be played for, paid for a, a a job that you enjoy doing at the club that you support, there's no better job in the world. Was it ever difficult for you to play against Tibbs? I know you you have your professional. Um, perspective on things and you were probably very capable of pushing down any the emotional side of things but was there any point where you felt oh, I wish I was on the other side of this? I, th- I think the older you get and you, you realise that obviously at St Mirren like that I remember I remember one of the first things I looked for when I'd signed with St Mirren is when, when, when would we be playing Hibs like that was one of the first things because it was obviously 
to play with him would be one step better, but just to play against him and to be in the mix. I mean, it was only two months before that I was watching all the players on sports scene and then I was flung into a game against Dundee United. I think it was, was my first game for St Mirren. Uh, I think it ended up being a draw. And then it just so happened that second game of the season, uh, Hibs fans probably won't like me reminding them, but we played Hibs at New St Mirren Park and I think it was my flick the, the middle of the second half that that put in Craig Dargo and Darg scored and we ended up winning one 0 and I got man of the match after it and I got that was when I done the big bottles of champagne with man of the match so I was always uh, uh, that was that was obviously fond memories for a St Mirren perspective but as I say Hibs fans probably won't thank me for for reminding you but no I, I'd always enjoyed it. it was always something I looked for in the calendar playing Easter Road playing against Hibs uh, something that was obviously very very special this season. Just, um, we've got a couple of questions here, Dan, just sort of, sort of quick fire ones, if you don't mind, just sort of going through your career yeah. and potentially quite Hibs-centric. Um, during during sort of your, your career, um, you've obviously played under a few managers. Who would you say is sort of the best manager you've played under? Um, you can be as diplomatic as you like here. I think I would, I would, I would and instead of saying one, I would, I would probably take a, a couple of traits to different managers. I mean, obviously, I think currently the manager that we've got at present, the gaffer, is, uh, is such a well-rounded sort of man, if you like, uh, very good speaker, good organiser, just a good, just obviously a good guy, he can speak to anybody and everybody. Uh, so he's definitely been instrumental in the way I sort of look at the game. Uh, Neil Lennon was, was another one which some people agree, some people disagree, but I think Neil Lennon a lot of the time gave some of the be best team talks you've ever heard because they were totally off the cuff, uh, unscripted, and he would... Uh, the same way he could sort of berate you and call you every name under the sun, he could also praise you. So you you did get a you get a real lift for for just him as a person and how sort of motivational he was. Um, and then obviously just Dan, Danny Lennon would be there just for the sheer fact that he probably seen something in me that and believed in me that that not a lot of other managers seen. And uh, uh, obviously paid him back in that regard. But just to take that initial initial uh, sort of chance on me. And, and sign me for, for cow and beef, definitely. And obviously, Alan McCoy at Rangers was great. I mean, I went for watching him on, obviously, um, what was the programme he done again? I can't believe I forgot that. The one that, question is what? I went for watching him on question is what? To obviously him be my manager. And he was just, as you can imagine, he is what he's like on TV, just such a sort of personable guy. And like, when five minutes, you feel like you've known him for, for, for most of your days. So, yeah. Uh, yeah, I can take take nuggets for everybody. Everybody. And who who's throughout your career, who's sort of the best player you've played with and also who's your toughest opponent? Played with. So it would obviously John McGinn, I would say, over the course of my career, I was lucky enough to see him develop as a youngster at St. Mirren, being the wee sort of sixteen year old meatballers, as uh, Big Tom we used to call him. And then just to see him develop and flourish at St. Uh, after St Mirren coming to Hibs and then seeing him kick on again for Aston Villa and what he's done and how instrumental he is at Aston Villa and also uh, as a Scotland player as well so it's great to see the progress that he's made uh, and there's been little get the other mentions in there as well Guy Aaron Moy at, at St Mirren was, uh, went on to sign with Huddersfield he was uh, Kenny McLean at St Mirren there's a lot of guys at St Mirren that have went on to have really good careers that I'd, I was obviously lucky enough to see them at the, the start of their career in terms of playing against, I think it was just because it was my first season uh, in the SPFL. Uh, Rangers, a guy called Nikita Jelovic, I think I've mentioned that before. I uh, always felt the strikers that were were physically strong, but also asked you questions in games. So they would pull you into positions whereby they might not necessarily be wanting the ball, but they wanted to create space for another player to run into. So I think he was he was just really good at that, just constantly asking, asking you questions. So after the game, you weren't just physically tired you were you were mentally tired as well so he was definitely up there a uh, bit of a different question but which of your teammates at Hibs or former teammates it might be a former one but you want to go for the for this uh, had sort of the weirdest traits or the weirdest mannerisms that you had to deal with in the dressing room weirdest traits and mannerisms Flo, Flo Camberry definitely the guy who was constantly looking in the mirror 23 hours a day uh, lifting his top up checking his six back out Checking his teeth, checking his hair. Uh, definitely the most self-absorbent 
person I know. <laughs> and it helps that he's left as well, so I can uh, hopefully he doesn't feel that. <laughs> he might try and help, help him when he um, when we play up with him. And who was um who was your sort of favourite Hibs player or Hibs hero when you were growing up, Darren? Uh, I think obviously I mean I can remember Frank Sozzi. Obviously when I, I started playing football, started off as a midfielder and then sort of dropped back into defence. So I was playing centre and a half for Leaf for a while and obviously I think Frank comes was it sort of, was it two thousand? Was it just after two thousand? Might have been there or thereabouts. So I'm probably fifteen, sixteen, probably just coming to mark getting into my, my sort of peak phys- physicality and and just to see a centre half that could obviously play football it takes set pieces I've never known a centre half that takes set pieces in my life so to see to see Frank take set pieces and uh, uh, just just how good he was on the ball how technically proficient he was how calm he was and how effortlessly he sort of made football look it was never ever stretching or never ever looked strained in a game it always just looked like he sort of flowed through the game so he was definitely somebody I looked up to him. I also like Mick, so I've said that before, like Mick, so until he released Mick Hogan Beef and then, and, then <laughs> and then I didn't like him. I just liked how he was just a big powerhouse centre forward that just used to sort of ragdoll defender. So, uh, and Russell Latape as well. Who, who couldn't love Russell and how great it was at the time. And I heard they used to smoke like 20 or 30 fags a day, which just made it even better because I thought this wee guy smokes 30 Lambert and Butler a day and he's, and he's still that good. I think you, you just briefly mentioned there um, about sort of you know, watching Hibs when you were you were playing for Leith Athletic, and obviously the the news that came out last last week, couple of weeks ago, that they'd um, made you a, a club ambassador. I mean, obviously in football, guys get a, yeah. a lot of um, accolades and, and whatever. But how how important is it to you um, sort of doing the community side of things and also receiving that sort of kind of recognition from you know if you like your people, you know, a club that you've played for from your community? Yeah, it was massive. I mean, I got asked by. Uh... By Jerry Friedman. I'm not sure if he's still the chairman, but he's been acting chairman. He's been in and around Leaf since I, since I can remember. And I rem- uh, 1996 is when I actually first. I think that they'd taken a, they'd taken a, a bit of time off. They had sort of went defunct for a while. And then I think 96 is when they sort of came back, came back into the fold. And that's when I signed with them. So I played through every age group uh, with, with Jerry's laddie, Kevin Friedman. So really good friends with Jerry. And uh, as I say, born and bred a Leaf, I've played Leaf for the best part of nine or ten years. So to be asked just to represent them and be the face of any sort of ambassador stuff they want done, whether it, whether it be attending sort of gala days or or play the year uh, awards. I always remember when I was younger, if I could meet a, a professional football player, I was always sort of in awe of them because oh, they played professional football and that was that was what I sort of aspired to be. So I think it's massive in football when you're given the platform uh, and and the pedestal, you have to give back. You have to give back to the younger guys because you, who knows who you could inspire, the next person you could inspire by just being you. It costs nothing to be yourself and to give back to the community, which basically basically made you. So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm big on that, helping, helping other people that are less fortunate or even just giving people advice because I feel that the career, the career that I've had and the experiences that I've went through, I think I've jumped through most hoops to get to where I am. So if I could even just share a wee bit of knowledge and help somebody along that path, not even necessarily to be a professional football player, but I think the, the, the role at Leaf allows me to do that, similar to the, to the, to the role at Hibs. To talk a little bit more about your role at Hibs, obviously two years is quite a long time in football and um, you've still got two years left on your contract. Is the ambition for you sort of trying to earn another four-year deal? Are you sort of looking just season by season from now? What's uh, what's your kind of thinking when it comes to, to the rest of your career? I think I need to start twisting a few arms to get another four-year deal. Or maybe start blackmailing a few people, but I don't know. I think that's very, very unlikely. But no, as I say, I think when we were given that role, me and Dave were both both under the impression that we wanted to play as long as as long as we physically could. And, and uh, to be fair, I'm training every day. I feel good. I feel good at present. I, I'm not naive enough to think that that could change. It could change with a manager, it could change with an injury, it could change with anything. So I think in the background, that's why you have to be sort of vigilant and you have to do as much as you can do to try and prepare yourself for the next stage. And as I say, at present, I'm, I'm currently doing my badges. Whether or not it'll be any good, I mean, who knows? You, you, you definitely have to try that, but it's something that I'm interested in. And I've, as I say, just in the same 
same thing with Leaf giving back. If I can give back, whether it be in a coaching role or, or some other role, I'll be happy to do that. I'll be happy to do anything for Hibs. But I think currently, as I say, I'm, 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 I'm in a good place in terms of I'm training every day. I feel fit. I feel that I can still contribute. Whether that means that I'm playing every week or no, I think that's that's up for debate. I think there's guys behind me that are obviously breathing down my neck that are, that are, that are assets, that are guys that are probably better in a, a lot of capacities than me. But I, I, I still truly feel that I've, the one thing that I have to offer will never change is, is my, my, my love that I have for Hibs and the commitment that I have when I go in the park that I always try to be the best that I can be. And I know being a fan, what it means to fans. So I always try and show that in my performances. Uh, so even times when I'm not doing as well, I, I, I still hold the value sort of uh, close to myself. And I always try and, uh, yeah, just be the best person that I can be. I can always remember when I, when I didn't play with Hibs and I was obviously just a part-time football player that when Hibs had a bad performance, you'd always hear people going, oh, well, should have done this or should have done that. So I know how much it means to fans to be in to, to potentially be in that, that that place and I'm now in this place I've been a fan and I'm now in a place where I can contribute and I can help so that's that's always at the forefront of my mind when I go into a game so I just play as long as I can and when when that's uh, when that's past me I'll try and go into a, a different a different avenue and, and try and be the best that I can be in that avenue as well just before we wrap up Darren um, I think obviously we, we touched on it earlier with regards to sort of the the, the the sort of difficulty maybe fans getting into it this season with, with the sort of, you know, the lockdown situation, whatever. But I think at the end of the day, Hibs are on course for a third place finish, which is by any measure a good season. We've still got, you know, um, Scott Allen to come back at the team. Joe Newell's just signed on for another couple of years. Josh Doig's, you know, developing all the time. Kevin Nisbet's, you know, to come back into the team. We've got McGuinness, who probably hasn't really had a run yet because of injuries and whatever. How how good can this Hibs team be if we can keep it together for the next couple of years? Do you think do you think it's a team that could really go on and really solidify that sort of third place latter stages of cup competitions? Yeah, listen, I think that where we are at present, the stage of the the season, and the amount of bodies we've got available. I mean, saying that just in there, I don't want to jinx anything, but I think the the medical team's done an unbelievable job, seeing that we're on a sort of a, a slimmer uh, playing playing staff and we've still got as I say you can maybe argue coming up, up into Christmas the, the bench was looking a bit thin and maybe lacking a wee bit of quality I, I mean but you can only look at the bench on the weekend you look at the players that weren't even on the bench so we're definitely in a good place and we've got we've got guys we've tied guys down that are still young they start, I mean Doggy's 19 Pope was 21 Joe's in the prime of his career hopefully there'll be a, a couple more to follow so there's definitely there's definitely building blocks there that that I believe if we do keep the same team and we keep that sort of culture and continuity going, there's no reason why we can't finish and where we are at present. As I said before, I've seen a few people mention it. I think that that has to be an aspiration instead of it being once every sort of 10 to 15 years, it should be. should definitely be up there challenging more often. And I, and I believe that the, the, the squad they've got just now, and uh, if they can build on that and keep people out of the key players, then why, sh- why shouldn't we be up there? It was great to hear from Darren McGregor. Uh, it was a real pleasure to, to chat to him. And we'd like to thank Darren again for giving up some time after training to, to talk to us. We wanted to take the time after the interview just to kind of do a roundup of uh, what it was like in February to be a Hips fan, really. For the most part, pretty damn good. But unfortunately, as, as alluded to there in the interview, kind of ended on a sour note. Uh, I mean, Stu, what's been your general reflections on how the team have fared these last four weeks? I, I think actually when I was sort of thinking about how to, how to broach this with you, my initial sort of thought was, you know, the, the resurgence of Jack Ross, if you like. Um, I'm kind of, um, you know, I can be quite balanced in my chat, but I'm quite all or nothing. And after the St. Johnston semi-final, um, I wasn't really Jack Ross out, but I was kind of like, well, I don't really care. If he, if, if he did go tomorrow, I wouldn't really care. You know, against Rangers, we, we put in a bit of a performance. Um, I thought we were we were probably quite unlucky not to take something from that game considering um you know some of the the stuff that went on that we we won't say too much more about um and then four wins on the trot like you cannot argue with four wins on the trot um and a couple of good performances in there as well and at least one of them is undoubtedly a big game (laughs) the one against Aberdeen there is there's no way it's anything other than that um 
more, you know, the, to end the month on a defeat was really disappointing, and the manner of the defeat was really disappointing. However, losing one game in five is a blip. It's not a crisis. I think we, we can't lose sight of that. Maybe I'm coming at it from the wrong angle, but that's certainly what I think. Yeah, I think there's a bit of a sense this season. Uh, we've seen it spoken about it sort of on the forum. We've seen people speak about it quite often, that there's a sense that there's a little bit more negativity this season. I think if there is, that's kind of unavoidable. You know, if you look at what's happening, if you look at the kind of, you know, the crap time that a lot of people have had, people don't have the same kind of catharsis going to football matches and they're not able to vent in the same ways. So as some people come on to internet forums or go onto Twitter and they're a little bit more animated, they're a little bit more hyperbolic when things don't go, you know, the way they want them to. I think it's understandable. Uh, it can be frustrating, sure particularly if you sort of have a more positive outlook yourself. But yeah, this is definitely not a crisis. Um, I think most people don't say it that way. You know, it's one disappointing defeat. And, you know, the manner of the defeat, I think, was probably what people were most frustrated by because it seems that when we concede first, it just doesn't look like we're going to score, which is something I think we'll come on to talk about. But yeah, we've, we've got to be happy when, you, when you're a Hibs fan and you see us win four league games on a trot. What, we scored eight goals in those games. We only conceded one. You've got to be happy with that and to get a win against Aberdeen, which is such a rare thing for us in recent years. Yeah, I think overall, taking away disappointment of the game against Motherwell, we've got to be delighted. I think you touched on it there about there's been a lot of chat about, you know, we don't win or take points from, from losing positions very often. And it's it's an arguable, it's true, that that is a bona fide fact. However, I think you also have to look at it and say, well, we're still third in the league and we've still won, I think, the third most games in the league we're the third top scorers in the league. We've got the third best defence in the league. You know, when you put all that together, it maybe suggests that actually the reason we don't take that many points when we're in losing positions is because we don't actually go behind as often as when we go ahead. Um, you know, I'm putting a bit of a positive spin on that. Of course, it's something that you have to look at. Um, how you react to going a goal down is, is huge in football. Always has been, always will be. But it's a good season. Um, finishing third in the league is a good season and that's where we're on course to be you know we, we did reference it during the interview with Dan and you referenced it just there as well is the fans not being there is, is a huge issue and it does totally cloud how you how you see the team I think it's always different for yourself because you, you are kind of a bit more of a remote fan because of your where, where you're living for me I find that I'm far more reactionary currently because you can be you know, you don't have that cooling off time, whether it's a pint in the pub, whether it's the drive home, whether it's the walk home. And, you know, if, if you're at the game and you kind of go to type something on your phone and you're like, I'm, I'm you know, saw this, I'm watching the game. Whereas when you're in the house watching it on an iPad, you've got, you know, access to whatever platform or you can just sit and rant at whoever's sitting in front of you. <laughs> and it is, it, it's a far... Yeah, it's, it's a totally different environment for watching football and I think you're seeing a totally different reaction to what you'd normally be seeing towards a Hibs team sitting third in the league. Yeah, I think that's a really good point. Um, and it's something that maybe, you know, it doesn't come up often in conversation because people don't like to talk about it. It's, you know, talking about football and enjoying a football match or even ranting about a football match is an escape for people. And, uh, you know, if right now they don't want to reference the fact that we're all stuck in our houses, if they don't want to reference the fact that Lots of horrible things are happening outside their doors. I don't blame them. Um, you know, I, I think it's absolutely understandable for, for us to sort of try and create a bit of a refuge at the moment. Look at another, uh, another sort of element of the run of games we've been on and something that was spoken about after the, the Motherwell match was uh, that was a missed opportunity. Um, I, I see what people are saying, but ultimately I think it was more of a missed opportunity for Aberdeen because, you know, whilst we could have pushed ahead of them, they're still, what, four points behind We've got a game in hand. You know, that was one more game ticked off that they haven't got up to us. So uh, I think there's some positives to take from that. I think that's definitely something you have to look at is it's, um, you know, if every game that we tick off now that we don't lose, or sorry, Aberdeen kind of lose ground or don't gain ground on us, it's, it's another game towards where we are going. It's no one else is in the running now. Third and fourth is between us and Aberdeen. There, there is no one else going to get involved in that. And, you know, I dare say I might feel about it a curse on that but I just don't see it so I think you know is it's just a case of ticking off the games now we've, we've still got not a bad we run of games coming up it's just put Saturday behind us and make sure that we a win the game in hand to really put the pressure on Aberdeen 
and B, just don't drop stupid points. Um, you know, it, it's I think that's kind of you know that's football one hundred and one, really, isn't it? And it's never going to be like that. As you're always going to drop stupid points in the season, but you know, yeah, it's it's like you say, it's it's ticking off boxes game by game, and just you know, between now and end of the season, performances don't really matter. It's grinding out points to get us where we need to be, and then it's been touched on. But we have a really, really good chance of playing group stage European football next season. You know, Definitely. that's just say that again. Group stage European <laughs> football for him. Yeah, it might not be some of the most glamorous teams, but there's going to be a few good games in there, and it's a guaranteed. I think is it six or eight games in Europe, which is just amazing. Mm -hmm. <laughs> like, you know, it's dreamland stuff. Yeah. So looking back, then the last five matches, if you were to pick a player, uh, one player that sort of stood out this month, who would you choose and why? I, th I think there's two. Him, I would have to have to say is um, the obvious ones. Man, we've just spoke to Darren McGregor. Um, you know, came back in, and. So sort of galvanised the team, whether it was a bit of leadership in there, whether it was just a fresh face, but you know, I, I don't quite know. But it, I don't think it's a coincidence or run a good form sort of coincided with Darren coming into the team. And the second one is the man who I've continuously said is never a striker, is Martin Boyle, <laughs> who's um who's who scored quite a, quite a few goals. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I think those two. Um, I'm sure there's cases to be made for another couple, and I, I dare say you're going to do that. Um, but I think those two are the the ones that would sorry I would say stood out for me. No, I, I don't think anybody could argue with those. You know, Martin certainly uh, made his case very clear, and um, it's good to see him backfiring again because when he gets his head up, he's you know he's one of the most dangerous players in the league. So we'll need to remember running. If I'm to mention one more player, uh, I would say Chris Cadden probably does some unseen work to coin a phrase that is quite often. <laughs> misattributed and sort of joked about uh, i'm not talking about brian kerr <laughs> uh, i mean he ge he genuinely does do a power of work i think uh, i saw a stat from calvin charlton that said in the 90 minutes that he's played he's covered more ground on average than any hips player this season so already you're seeing the, the difference in terms of the mobility in midfield that he brings um or you know right through from the, the right wing back position it's not all come come off for him you know it's not like He's bust the net with uh, the chances he's had, or that he's got a load of assists to his name so far. I think that will come. You know, he's been he's been threatening to do so, but I just think his presence, his physicality, the work effort he puts in, it's it's all really led into the team being a little bit more dynamic, and I think that's helped us a lot. Yeah, I, I think just one more player I want to mention just before we we move on, um, and if if he's listening, then please stay. Is um, Jack Snurvin? I think he's been um. Uh, 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 um a really good, really good signing. Um, I don't think anybody could argue with that. Yeah, I mean, we should have asked Aaron to to have a word actually, but oh well, missed opportunities. Yeah, I think Jack Snavin's been terrific, but I, I guess we all knew he would yeah. be as one of his players that all the fans wanted to come in. Yeah, definitely. Um, I, I think that's one that I, I don't think many people could have really um said that that was ever not going to work out. I mean, I know every signing on paper doesn't um work out, but it's a guy who's proven quality in this league and had a, had a good stint down south as well. Um, so, yeah, I, th I think just one other thing I wanted to talk about before um, before we moved on, um, Gav, was I think Kieran, I seen him um, mention something the other day, that he's now 23 months into his stint as fans rep. Um, now, obviously, that's a, a two-year term, so um, he was saying that, you know, it's it's going to be something that's coming up shortly. Um, and I think he also said he wouldn't be restanding. So I think, first of all, um, I would say that I think Kieran's been brilliant in the role really really good um, I think he's kind of done what I always envisaged, envisaged that role being and I'm going to go into a bit more detail about kind of what are the problems I find with the role um, sort of in a, in a few minutes um, but yeah I, I think that's something that's definitely definitely worthy of discussion because it is an important um, facility particularly with a new new owner being on board um, with regards to you know the, the fans voice if you like absolutely I mean I think and I don't mean this as a slight on anybody else who's held the role because I know it's a lot of work and uh, you know to volunteer so many hours towards Hibs it's a it's a very selfless thing to do but I think Kieran set the standard now I think you know anybody who comes after him is sort of living up to the work ethic he's put into it and the availability that he's um, that he's shown to the fans so yeah uh, thank you to Kieran also for for putting in so many hours and to everybody else who held the role previously but I know it's something that you'd like to sort of delve into a little bit more whether the role is really fit for purpose. 
Yeah, um, first of all, um, I just just want to clarify as well that um, I, I certainly um, wasn't slighting anybody else either. I know you're not implying that, um, but <laughs> I, just, I just think like Keane's sort of done what I expected the role to be more than, um, you know, I, I remember um, Frank Dugan standing outside um, Easter Road handing out um, vouchers at about five o'clock in the morning for people that queued up for hatch tickets, so you don't get more committed than that. <laughs> um, so yeah, it, it definitely, I think everyone's everyone's done the role well in, in their own way. I think for me, what one of the issues I have is I think, and it's nothing that any fan trip has done wrong, I think people's expectation of the role is different from what can be delivered. Um, you know, is boards, first of all, dealing confidentiality. You know, someone can't come out and give out commercially sensitive information or tell you what was discussed in a board meeting without it being vetted by the rest of the board. I think secondly on that front is boards put up sort of unanimous fronts. You know, Hib, Hibs board could be made up of 10 people. I don't actually know how many people are on the Hibs board and the vote could be 7-3 in favour of something, but they will come out and everybody will back that decision, whether they put up a fight or not. And I think certainly in cases maybe where like, you know, the whole Rangers scenario a couple of years ago, there seemed to be almost an implication that, you know, the fan reps hadn't done enough. And I said, well, actually, you don't know what was said behind closed doors, but once that decision's made, they have two choices. It's either back the decision or resign the position and it's um you know that that's a, a tricky one for them and I, I think as well and I, I think this is probably something we could go a bit deeper into is I think fans rep is a difficult title because you know how do you represent the views of all hips fans it's so diverse mm -hmm. it's so diffuse I just think it's really really difficult to to actually say that someone can be there and represent the view of all fans and I think that where Kieran excels is he takes little things that individuals have said and presents them as, you know, concerns or ideas of individuals. I think that's very much what it is. And maybe like a little rejig of the whole position might be in order. I don't know. Maybe I'm coming at it from the wrong angle. Yeah, quite possibly um, a rejig might be, you know, to make it more fit for purpose. I know that after Tracy stepped down, that there wasn't then immediately an election for somebody else. So it might be that, Hibs internally have been thinking about the role. Um, I, you know, I don't know if the implications of that are that they were already thinking about making changes to the fans' rep, whether it's a change in title or or something more um, in depth. We spoke a little bit earlier, and we've seen quite extensively on social media and on and on Hibsnet that people have been talking about the fact that HSL don't have a representative on the board currently because they didn't quite meet the, the share percentage required. I know they were only a few percentiles off. Um, is that something that you think the club might be suited to maybe reconsider and uh, and to possibly give some time to? I think it's it's an interesting one because I think I'm right in saying the HSL are, are now the, currently the, the second biggest shareholder um, of the club. And within that, obviously, there's, there's you know, a, a few thousand fans, I'm not totally sure an exact figure, paying in every month or are members of that organisation. Um, so yeah, I think you know if you're wanting kind of fans' voice on the board, that could be be one avenue to go down. In saying that, I do like the idea of still having an election as well. You know, for for somebody that's actually put their their proposal forward, I I don't know if it's maybe a case of cutting the fans' reps down to one and possibly having a rotational HSL representative as is the other one. Um, you know, no one really knows at the moment sort of what, what Ron Gordon's thoughts on this kind of thing is, and that that's not a slight on him. As you know, he's been very open and he's clearly put his money where his mouth is with regards to Hibs, absolutely. Um, but yeah, I, I think it, it's going to be interesting over the next um, couple of months when when that sort of um, election time comes and goes, because I don't think we're going to have one next month. Um, to see to see where Hibs see it going and how they how they see the sort of fans make up on the board in in the next probably couple of years. Speaking about the owner putting his money where his mouth is, uh, we had some good news regarding two player contracts recently as well. I just give a little bit of lip service to to that. I'm I'm sure you're delighted as as the rest of the Hips fans are that that Joe Newell and and Josh Doig agreed with fresh terms. Yeah, um, absolutely. I think um, um, Joe Newell's been sort of um, almost resurrection man at Hibs. <laughs> um, I remember after the the six six one defeat at Ibrox, um, I think he got hooked at half time. He was played on the left wing that day, and I think I actually said if I never see that guy in a hip strip again, like it wouldn't bother me one bit. And you know, it 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 took him a while to get going, but once he was moved in the middle and once he was played in what I think is quite clearly his best position, um, he's been brilliant. Like um, a really really good player, the kind of player I enjoy watching. Mm -hmm. 
Um, and then Josh Doig, I mean, um, I think, um, again, to go back, Darren referenced it as, um, you know, it's, I can't quite understand how Hearts looked at that guy and went, yeah, he's not good enough for our first team. I know they had Aaron Hickey at the time, he was also a good player. Um, but yeah, I mean, I don't think you can ever have too many good players. And um, yeah, Josh just, the thing I like about him is he's clearly got better from the start of the season. He looked a promising player from the start of the season. He's maturing, he's learning, and he seems to be growing into the role. And I think he's now undisputedly our number one left back, which um, I think that's the first time we've been able to say that's anyone other than Lou Stevenson for about a decade. Yeah, the best part of. Yeah, if we're to tear apart how Hearts identify a player, we could be here for, for very many hours, uh, given some <laughs> of the sh** that they've managed to recruit over the years. But um, yeah, I mean, uh, their, their loss is our gain. I was somewhat surprised that we, we got the, the deal done with Josh so quickly. And, and the same with Joe as well. I think some, some fans probably had him out the door. And it was even referenced in his own interview that that was never in his mind. It was just something that other people kind of attributed towards him for some reason maybe it's a slightly pessimistic side of hips fans but uh, thankfully the club's sort of gone about his business very professionally at the moment yeah really really delighted to get two very good players tied up yeah absolutely i think um obviously i think we're just about to sort of round up here but i think it's just to come back to sort of the last question i am um, asked Aaron, so he answered it very honestly i thought and i think it's worth repeating again is that the Hibs are actually potentially on the verge of actually being able to sort of solidify you know that sort of third third place um, you know, Aber- Aberdeen, by all accounts, got costs to cut. Um, you know, they're they're a team that very much look like they're about to go into real transition. Hearts don't look like a team that are going to come back into the Premier League and you know, you know, blow blow the place no. away. This absolutely not. <laughs> and and you look sort of down the league, and there does seem to be an increasing gap sort of between third, fourth, and and fifth and sixth. I mean, who would just sort of had Livingston and St Mirren in those positions at the start of the season? Um, you know, as as guy teams like Dundee United, maybe Kilmarnock that have been there or there about the last few years, Motherwell have been there the last few years, have all kind of fallen away a little bit. And I think it's a real chance um to put our you know foot down and, and motor on. And I think getting guys like that signed up and bringing in the players that we have brought in, um, yeah, I I think it's um it, it's potentially looking like it could be a good time to be a Hibs fan, and hopefully sooner rather than later we're all there to see it. Yeah, that's what we all want. Thank you everyone who tuned in to episode 1 of Hibs.pod. First and foremost, we hope you enjoyed the show. If you'd like to reach us with any feedback, you can get to us on Twitter at Hibsnet, Facebook, Hibsnet again, or Instagram at Hibs.net, and of course on the forum at www.hibs.net. Pretty self-explanatory that one. We'll be more than happy to hear your views, what you liked, what you think might you know, need a bit of a change. Uh, but please do be gentle, because there's only so much constructive criticism that my fragile ego can handle. And on that note, we hope to see you again next month with a new episode and a new guest. But until then, take care of yourselves, take care of one another, and on the high base.